Welcome to Talking Kootenai Books. My name is Keith Powell. I'm your host. And today my guest is Hugo Hess. Hugo is well known in the uh, uh, Cranbrook area. You've lived here for many, many years. Is that right, Hugo? That's correct, Keith, yes. <laughs> so I, I want to congratulate you, Hugo. You've just come out with a new book called Hugo's Memories. Yes. And uh, really just reflecting on your, your life here in the Kootenays, yes. I wanted to ask you uh, maybe just to tell us about your early years. Uh, how did your family end up in Canada and so forth? Well, well, actually, I was born in Bessarabia, Romania. Mm -hmm. And uh, things were getting tougher over there in the old days, and Dad figured that uh, we start or getting itchy feet too, maybe. But right. he wanted to move on and uh, come to Canada. So where did you end up at? Uh, we ended up in Windle. Okay, so just outside of Creston. So you spent your boyhood years in Windle. In Windle, yes. I grew up and finished. I graduated from high school, Creston Valley High School. What was it like to be a boy in Creston back in what would it have been the 30s, 40s? Well, actually, I, we came here in 1930, Keith. Yeah. So uh, uh, it was the start of the Depression. And uh, yeah, we we're just uh, poor people, very poor people, mm -hmm. and along with everybody else. And. Uh, uh, lived in Windle. We didn't uh, have a vehicle or a telephone or anything like that. So, you know, we uh, we did the things. We played uh, wherever at the CPR station or wherever we could find a place and uh, <laughs> played with the other kids. And yeah. well, Windle was a going concern in in, in the 30s and 40s. Uh, uh, what was the driving industry there? Uh, the strawberries. It was strawberry capital. We called it, they called it the strawberry capital of the world, of course, okay. like everybody else. But uh, yeah, they grew a lot of strawberries. So your parents, your family was involved in agriculture? Uh, we had a farm. Dad had a farm in, in uh, Korzyk in Romania and uh, grew grapes, mm -hmm. made wine, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a regular, a regular farm. Right. And then when he came over to Windle, he continued that? Well, he didn't think he had to because the CPR salesman said that when you come to Canada, you can throw away your hoe and uh, just hold your hands under trees and the money will <laughs> f f fall in. So that didn't happen. Uh, so he was in for a little bit of a rude awakening. He got a little bit of a shock. Yeah, we got uh, to Winnipeg, of course, and had to hold up there for a week till he found a home for us. But uh, eventually the Lutheran Church sponsored us to come to Wintle to work for a strawberry farmer. And we were the family that was chosen. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And how, how many years did your family reside in Wendell? Uh, well, all their lives, too. Uh, Mom was 90 when she passed away. But, oh, she moved to Creston that a few years. Okay. And Dad, when he passed away, he, we still live in Wendell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your boyhood years, when you were a young man, you were in Wendell. But uh, you were drawn to Cranbrook, and you ended up uh, settling in Cranbrook. Uh, wh when did you arrive in Cranbrook? Well, I, actually, in the fall of 48, uh, I drove a horse for a living. I thought I was going to be a logger. You see, big, big time money. And uh, so I drove a horse getting logs in Wendell. And a buddy of mine I went to school with, uh, they need a teamster in Cranbrook and Teepee Creek. Mm -hmm. Well, I snapped that job up in a hurry. I'm going to the big time. So uh, there I came. That was in the fall of 48 when the mill shut down. Um, in the so cold that year, it was 38 below every Fahrenheit every every night. So anyway, eventually had to shut down. And uh, anyway, from there, we, I went back home again. And in the spring, I would play ball. I was kind of a ball player, too, way mm -hmm. back in Wendell, because there's not many people, you see. So right. <laughs> I was just a little guy. But anyway, I, got, I made the team because they didn't have enough players. So, But uh, anyway, we would have been Eddie from the uh, Bing Hotel. He was sponsoring the uh, ball team. And he knew that I was a little back catcher. So he phoned me up one day. Come to Cranbrook, I have a job for you. Mm. Uh, I have a job, and uh, you could be my back catcher. Mm -hmm. well, up I goes. Right. So you ended up settling in Cranbrook. You've lived in Cranbrook for many years. Um, you operated, uh, well, you worked for a, a number of people, but you've also operated your own business. Is that correct? In the end, I started out, in the end, I did get, I, I did take up uh, training uh, diesel engineering mm -hmm. uh, uh, by uh, correspondence and then practical in Edmonton. And when I came out, of course, uh, no job, uh, no experience, just, you know, a job. So I went back to the sawmill again. And, uh, and one day a break came and I, I got a bed of mechanic out doing a job out in the uh, uh, Mineral Lake area. And uh, so he's, I told him my story and he said, well, we could use somebody like you in town. So I worked for East Coot Equipment, Bobby Knight, East Coot Equipment. Uh, and uh, so that worked there 14 years. Wow. 
And then you also had your own business, is that then, correct? Then I was itching too to get get my own business and the things were starting to slow down there too because of, of different circumstances. And uh, this, this little service station came up for sale and we managed to squeak and do this and do that and hmm. got enough money for a down payment and away we went. Right. So many, uh, many people remember Hugo Zesso, right? Oh, that's right. They would know me from Hugo Zesso, <laughs> yeah. So Hugo, uh, the thing I admire about you is that you actually went through and completed a book. You know, I've encountered so many people that said, oh, I can write a book, no problem. But you took the story, you documented it, you, you wrote it down, right. uh, good for you. What was that experience like? Well, it was kind of a struggle to start with, for sure. Um, but I guess when I started out as a youngster, I was always going to be, uh, they told me I was going to be an inventor. I'm telling stories all the time, telling stories all the time, trying to figure out a better way. Well, anyway, uh, they often told me I should write a book. It never happened. Mm. So uh, anyway, uh, but our daughter Wendy and her partner Lane, they bought a book, it was the Tom Gray book as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. and I read his book and by golly, I said, I think I could do that too. <laughs> so that's what I started. So Tom from Gray Creek inspired you? Uh, his book did, yes. Yeah. I never met Tom, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, you know, from from my per personal perspective, I had the opportunity to work with you and help you publish that book. Yes. And I have to say it was a pleasure because, you know, you were very committed to making sure that that project happened. Oh, yes. And I have to <clears throat> tip my hat to Mary and your wife as well. Mary, because yes, yeah. She, she put a lot of effort into uh, making sure that your book came out uh, looking really, really well. good and read really well, <laughs> as, uh, too. So yes. uh, both of you worked as a team to get that project together. Mostly she was in, I never road. I, I got a computer. I went down and got bought a brand new computer. Just put it on the dining room table there it sat. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I didn't write because I was a very poor speller mm -hmm. and uh, didn't do well in school spelling. Other things I did very well. But anyway, so I'd come to a spelling check and sometimes the spell check didn't even <laughs> know what I was talking about. So she was my right hand yeah. person there, helped yeah. me out there. And, yeah. And, uh, yes. Well, she did a very good job, and uh, yeah. she, uh, the book uh, reads really well. So I'm just thinking back, uh, you know, your your life and your adventures and your stories and yeah. and so forth. Do any of those stories sort of stand out in your mind? Well, I I was wondering about that. They. Uh, I had some fun stories, and which I had, I liked them all. Every one I told, I did it with uh, enthusiasm, like you know, when I really enjoyed mm -hmm. writing about it. But one kind of stood out a little bit. Uh, I had fun. I was telling the boys at our walking club just the other day that uh, in Wendell we had a bobsleighing was the big thing, you see. So mm -hmm. one day uh, I'm out at a logging camp doing its work on a diesel engine and uh, here's a chainsaw in the dump. So I got a hold of that. It was a seven horsepower McCullough chainsaw and I, and I conned them in and given it to me. <laughs> so now what to do with it? Well, I thought I'd make a sleigh and make an airplane propeller, and I did. Right. I, I put, I mount on the back, made a bob sleigh with the runners outside and steering wheel the whole nine yards and a foot brake, of course, with a drag brake like the kids have for the, on their little dealie. Yeah, so, uh, so that's what uh, got me inspired of that one. Anyway, I, 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 I have to ask you, how did the sled work? With the oh, absolutely worked like a dream. I took off from our place, lived in 11th Avenue down there, and after it was all done, I had this, I made a, two by, a propeller out of a two by six. Yeah. Down Elizabeth Lake and up by Come Forth Avenue, there no days didn't sand the roads, you see. Yeah. So uh, it was a snowy road, ice in the road. Up by Come 11th and the dog come out after me and dip it at the propeller. Well, I just floorboarded her and I took off. I outgunned him. Yeah. Good thing for him and it's a good Good thing for me because I'd have been <laughs> so that with that I wouldn't put a, uh, a a guard over it. Right. So that was a fun deal. That was a yeah. fun story. Yeah, and that's really indicative of many of the stories that are in your book. They they have some humor. They have uh, so, some compassion. You, you, yeah. You know you, the the humanity of the stories really come through, and I I commend you on on you know capturing that. Yeah. You were also very active in uh, outdoor activities. Uh, and that came through in the book as well. Uh, what kind of outdoor activities do you enjoy, Hugo? Well, <clears throat> when it comes, it was a fastball league. We had a fastball league, mm -hmm. and uh, outdoor. Well, right now it's mostly hiking. Yeah, we hike three, still hike three days a week. Yeah, and 
and uh, community forest mostly. Right. We used to go up to Bear Lake and places like that, but we haven't done that for a little while. But uh, now it's a community forest, and, and now we go to the uh, Idlewild, the, the gazebo to Idlewild for coffee. We bring our own thermos, and uh, I made a couple of little heaters, uh, rigged up a couple of heaters on a little sleigh and a wagon, and <laughs> away we go. We have fun. Mm. Well, good for you. Hugo, the book uh, is a tribute to your, to your life, and when you look back at it, um, just thinking back to your family when they were leaving the old country and, yes. and coming to Canada, did you ever in sort of anticipate the life that you ended up living? I don't think that, because I was just a baby in arms mm -hmm. myself. These are the, that's the one part of the book I had to uh, go from hand-me-down stories. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was tough for them. Our family was very sick on the ship, mm -hmm. and uh, it was pretty, uh, pretty hard on the family to yeah. come all the way from there to here for the sudden change, you right. know. Well, the tagline on your book is a life well lived, and I think that uh, really sort of sums up uh, the whole essence of the book. Uh, yes. You, you tell a good story and lots of uh, colorful incidents that are recorded there. Yes. And plus, it, you know, the thing I really enjoyed and appreciated about your book is that it gives us a glimpse into an era that many of us may never have encountered. Right. So I just wanted to thank you for uh, sharing that with us. Well, thank you, Keith. Yes, yeah, so my, my memory did go back a long ways, you know. Somehow I still got a pretty good memory. And uh, I can remember all those stories I remembered. I had to get, my brother helped me out in a couple of stories, and I told mm -hmm. stories about them too. But uh, yeah, I just kept moving right along. And I, and uh, rather than going out in my workshop and doing things, I pulled up a chair at the dining room table and mm -hmm. <laughs> went to work. Good for you. Well, I, again, uh, I really uh, appreciate the fact that you documented your life story, and uh, I, I'm pleased to have worked with you. So the book is called Hugo's Memories, A, a Life Well Lived, uh -huh. and uh, you've done an excellent job of putting that together. I think people in Cranbrook, Creston, and Window will really enjoy reading your book. Yeah, so. I think they will. But Keith, I also got to give you a lot of credit because you came to our gyro club and spoke to us about uh, your books and the what you did, mm -hmm. so I thought, man, oh man, Keith, you're, you're local here, and I just, what the heck, I'll get mm -hmm. hold of you, and you, you actually designed the cover, I, I give you the picture, and, mm -hmm. and so you did a lot of the uh, work, that the technical work, you might yeah. say. Well, it went together well, and so mm -hmm. I think we made a good team, so again, congratulations, Hugo. The book is Hugo's Memories, and uh, a pleasure to have you as a guest on Talking Kootenai Books. Thank you so much, Keith. My name is Keith Powell, and this has been Talking Kootenai Books. Welcome to Talking Kootenai Books. My name is Keith Powell. I'm your host, and today our guest is Laverna Peters. Laverna, you're with the Cranbrook and District Arts Council, is that right? Yes, that is. So correct. how long have you been involved in that organization? Three years. Okay, so what's the mandate of the Arts Council? The mandate, loosely spoken, of the Arts Council is to promote the arts in the, in the, in the Kootenai. Okay, so in Cranbrook, in the, in the region? Yes. And uh, is it a membership-driven organization? Yes, it sure is. Okay. And we have, I think, well over 200 members. Okay, so lots of artists, lots of uh, contributing artists uh, to, the, to the local art scene. Now, I, I, I invited you to be a guest today because the Art Council was involved in an interesting publishing project. And I was hoping to have you on the show earlier, but then, of course, COVID-19 showed up. And uh, you published the book at the end of 2019. Yep. And it's called 14 Trumpeting Elephants. So just tell us what the premise of the book is and how it all went together. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, 14 Trumpeting Elephants, when you think of the name, 14 Trumpeting Elephants, so what, is, what has that got to do with Cranbrook, right? Mm -hmm. And technically, when we re the, this book is, was inspired by the uh, elephants that escaped the Sells Photo Circus train in 1926. And actually, nobody actually knows how many elephants actually got off the train and how many they actually tracked down. Mm -hmm. But when we, when we got together as a committee to create this book, we just threw around some names and it just sounded like a, a great number. And actually when you write children's books and you include a number with the words, it makes it more interesting. Right. So that's sort of how that came to fruition. Okay, good. So uh, 14 Trumpeting Elephants, uh, an, an interesting historical tie-in 
with Cranbrook. And uh, so when I read through the book, I just thought, well, this is really well done. It tells the story in a very creative way. But the really neat thing is that it's so nicely illustrated. Is that the role of the artists from the Arts Council? Well, totally. And our project is, is really unique in that um, we knew when we got together and we talked about all the different ideas of what we wanted to do with this book, um, we, wanted to, we wanted to have Kootenai artists illustrate this book. Mm -hmm. Like, so it would really represent the, the area. Mm -hmm. Well, you did a good job because uh, it, it does represent the historical side of it, but it, there's some creative uh, writing in there too, and it, it sort of expands the story and, and really uh, gives the opportunity for a lot of the artists to be involved. So I just want to talk about the logistics of this project, because in the back of my mind, I'm thinking 12 or 14 artists all contributing to one project. That's got to be uh, quite a thing to pull together. How did that all go? It was a lot, um, and originally, the, the idea was brought to our board by one of our board members. And anyway, of course, when, when a new idea is part, part of Cranbrook and District Arts Council's, um, because it's a nonprofit organization, we're always looking for fundraising ideas. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so this person brought this idea of uh, creating a children's book like this. What has been the reaction to the book? Oh, very good. Yeah. yeah. It, it's been overwhelming actually. We printed 500 copies initially and we've sold, sold well over 300 copies to date. Okay. So you said it's a fundraiser for the Arts Council and yeah. so you had in mind that right from the start. Did that influence you as to how the book went together or how, how did you keep track of everything that uh, you know was required to make a book? Totally. Um, well, what happened in the end is we were a committee of three. Mm -hmm. The committee consisted of myself, Yvonne Vine, and Lynn Taylor. And what we did, kind of going back to your question originally, Keith, uh, is we met weekly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess one of the, the key things that we had to decide, first of all, is we had to find somebody to write the story. Mm -hmm. Although all three of us are artists, none of us were writers. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, so we found an author, actually a local author. It was really part of our, our goal as well to have somebody local write the story. So we found somebody that was willing to write the children's story and she agreed to our subject matter. And uh, anyway, so, and after that, of course, we had to find artists that would illustrate the story. And once the script was written, what we did was we, um, as a committee, we, we read through the story and we broke the script into scenes mm -hmm. uh, because actually this, the story is really, if you have, the op have had the opportunity to read it, it's about the adventures of one Charlie Ed. He was one of the elephants that escaped off of the train. Right. And anyway, so we broke it into, into scenes, which I don't know, about 17 different scenes. And then we, we had 13 artists that illustrated the book. Right. And so we gave them each the opportunity to choose a scene Mm -hmm. you know, of one of the adventures of Charlie Ed that they would illustrate. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have to say they did a wonderful job. They, they, they <laughs> illustrated the, the, the narrative really well and it's very imaginative in, in the approach as well. You know, the story is near and dear to my heart because I've written a book that to sort of uses the same uh, right. premise, uh, the yeah. background, and, and I just know that that was such a major story back in the 1920s, uh, mm -hmm. 1926 as you mentioned. Uh, you know, it received international play that, uh, and it's so great that you brought it to life again so that, you know, a new generation can appreciate the story and really uh, value what took place. So when you launched the book, how did you go about doing that? Oh, that was really exciting. The launching actually happened uh, last year, just before Christmas. Mm -hmm. And um, we, Cranbrook and District Arts Council, in August of 2018, we purchased a new building it, it's located at 1401 Fifth Street North, right beside the bowling alley. Okay. And so it was an opportunity not only to launch the book, but to show the public our new building. And uh, yeah, so all the artists were available to sign the book as well as the author. And um, the artist's illustrations as well as paintings were on display. So we sold tons of books that day, as well as a number of the artists sold pieces of their artwork. So it was a really exciting day and a really great way to you know start the the story off, really. Right. <laughs> a great way to get it launched and yeah. get people excited about the book. 
I, I was wondering uh, when I read through it, there seemed to be a, a, an involvement by uh, some of the school children in the area in Cranbrook. Uh, what was their involvement in the book? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I always think that a great way to get, get more generations to come on board and interested in, in what you're doing is to really focus on the younger generation. So um, Kate Rose's grade one and two class, they were learning about elephants. Mm -hmm. So when I approached her about the idea of having these children illustrate in our book as well. So what she did was she taught, that she actually showed them how to draw elephants. Okay. So what we did was we took their, pic their paintings and we, we sort of created little, little, um, little train tickets okay. around, the, around each painting. Mm -hmm. And so we, we strategically put them in different places inside the book. Mm -hmm. So it sort of looks like uh, when you open the book and read it, it looks like little footprints throughout the book. Mm -hmm. And what, was, what I think was really cool about that is that it creates continuity throughout your book too. Mm -hmm. and, and also, I guess, what, going back to what I was really first trying to say is, it, you know, you, when you give a young person a, a chance to be a part of a project like that, mm -hmm. what, I w what I was really hoping is it would inspire young artists to pursue their dreams in the end. Yeah. And who knows, it probably did. Uh, so yeah, it's great really. to have those uh, young people uh, involved. It's such a fun story and it's presented in such a fun manner. Um, I, I can see that uh, young people uh, will, would be really engaged in the story. So do you think it's important to take a historical event like that and, and really tell that story and let people know about it? Well, absolutely. Uh, you know, I say that this book really is, originally we read it, we wrote it, or we, we produced it, published it, whatever the correct word is, for eight to 12 year old kids. Mm -hmm. But really when you take a look at it, when I moved here, I didn't know why there was an elephant at the end of Baker Street, mm -hmm. right? I didn't know the history really in, I think often we don't know the history in our own backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I thought this, this is really an opportunity for children and adults alike to take a look at this and, and read it in a fun way. Right. And uh, I think you've accomplished that. It, it, it is a fun way. I just want to talk a little bit about the publishing process. I, I believe Friesen Press published it for you, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. We as a committee were involved in all the decisions. And what Friesen Press did for us was they edited the manuscript, as well as helped us with the layout of the, of the cover for the book, as well as the layout and how things, the layout on the interior of the book as well. I see. So did, uh, I, I'm just curious, did the uh, contributing artists keep the original photos or did, it, did, did those go to the uh, Arts Council? Or no, not the, photos, the paintings, I should yeah, say. Yeah, no, they, they kept their original work. I see. Yeah. yeah, and a number of them, like I said earlier, were able to sell their paintings at the launch okay. and afterwards. Great. So any other future projects in mind? What, what? Well, actually, yeah, we do. Okay. Um, particularly myself and Yvonne, who work on a lot of projects together, Yvonne Vine. Mm -hmm. um, we've been dis discussing different ideas because there's a lot of great history in, this, in the Kootenays. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like I know Sam Steele has been done a number of times, but I've, I've heard of a different angle mm -hmm. towards the Sam Steele story that could be told. Mm -hmm. And the ideas of um, all the different historical figures when you go look at the grave, graveyard mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm sure there's stories about different people that have lived here that would be interesting. Well, we say every life has a story. Oh, so. right, exactly, <laughs> right. You know, good. Well, we look forward to the future uh, uh, endeavors that you, you undertake. I just want to ask you before we wrap up here, what's new at the Arts Council? Oh, we're really in a, at an exciting place, actually. The building that I mentioned earlier that we bought in 2018, mm -hmm. we, are, we are just finishing up the renovations that we have done in the building. And the, this building will include a really nice large gallery as well as a pottery studio, as well as the traditional art of painting and drawing and stuff like that. And the other really exciting news, myself and Yvonne are actually personally involved in, we are painting a mural that is going to go on the outside of the building. Okay. Yeah, the, mu the mural is gonna be 10 feet high and 38 feet wide. So it's mm. a really big project that we've been working on since um, the beginning of August actually and we're just in the finishing steps. Well, good for you. That sounds like a big project. Let me ask you, does it have an elephant in it? It doesn't, but it has a bear. Okay. 
<laughs> well, we look forward to seeing that. Thank you for being our guest. So Laverna Peters uh, from Cramrick. The book is 14 Trumpeting Elephants, published by the Cramrick and District Arts Council. This has been Talking Cootie Books, and my name is Keith Powell. <laughs>